In this presentation, we'll get to know the idea or the concept of psychological flexibility and its relation to our well-being and to sustainability. Let's start with an experiment. This was a set of experiments that uh, were meant to explore the cognitive flexibility in humans and other primates. Cognitive flexibility is simply just a, a skill uh, to be able to switch or change one's behavior when the situation uh, makes it necessary or allows it. And in this set of experiments, um, they went like this. Um, the subjects or the participants, as shown here in this picture on the right, um, were shown a computer screen and um, it had four different fields or boxes. It was a touch screen and the subjects basically had to learn that when you touch the red square, then the yellow square, then a blue square will appear. And then when you touch the blue square, you will get a reward. So subjects had to learn this kind of uh, sequence over and over again. You touch the red one, the yellow one, a blue one appears. You touch the blue one, you get a reward. And so subjects were basically presented with this kind of screen over and over again. They learned it over many times. And at some point after many rounds of this, a new screen appeared. And this time the blue square was already visible right from the beginning. And so what would subjects do? One way, one thing to do might be to continue doing what you have previously learned. So touch the red square, the yellow square, and then the blue square, then you get a reward. Or alternative you, alternatively, you could also just touch right away the blue square and get a reward. And so this kind of experiment was done with various primate species, including baboons, chimpanzees, and humans. And the question was, which species will be better at switching to the more efficient strategy and why? Think about this for yourself and think about what you predict what will be the outcomes of these experiments. Which species of these th uh, three primates will be more efficiently like, able to switch to the more efficient, quicker strategy and why do you think that? Here are the outcomes of these experiments. The percent of trials in which um, these species, the participants, switch to the more efficient strategy. As we see, baboons, almost in all trials, they immediately switch to the more efficient strategy, whereas with humans, almost nobody switched to the efficient uh, strategy. This might be a very surprising result for us, and scientists are debating why we might observe this kind of surprising outcome. We might think that, well, don't we have these relatively large brains and shouldn't this basically allowing us to uh, much more flexibly react to our environments and it turns out that doesn't seem to be the case and there are a number of hypotheses or explanations being offered why we might observe this kind of pattern. So there is the idea that we humans have something like rule governed behavior meaning that once we have learned some, how to do something, we kind of tend to stick to it. Um, we do have, in these kinds of experiments, what was also found was that humans actually learn how to do the first sequence with these touch screens much, much faster than the other primates. So humans only take a few rounds to understand what's going on and what to do, whereas baboons and chimpanzees, they took many, many hundreds of trials to learn the initial sequence. So we can learn efficiently, but then we kind of stick to this learned rule much more rigidly. And there might be a role for, uh, in this of language. So the, the fact that we have language makes us able to encode certain rules in our mind, but then also we have much harder time to change the rules. Also the role of norm psychology, which means that we kind of notice very fast kind of the right ways to do things and then we stick to the way things are being done in our social cultural environment and there might also be a role of education being discussed for example in similar experiments it is found that younger children are actually much better at uh, switching to the efficient strategy than adults and so scientists are also discussing might there be a role of education 
leading us to become more more rigid in following certain rules. And so this presents us with another kind of paradox, namely that on the one hand, we humans seem to be a highly flexible species because thanks to our ability for culture, we inhabit virtually all ecosystems of the world and have a diversity of traditions, norms, forms of social organizations, technologies, and so on. And this is something that is quite unique among the primates. But on the other hand, as individuals, we humans seem to have a certain inability to change our behavior flexibly. Um, according to the phrase, man is a creature of habit. And indeed, many challenges of sustainable development and also of our own well-being can be often attributed to this challenge of flexible behavior change. And so one big challenge for sustainable development in general is how can we overcome this seeming inability for flexible behavior change. And so the field of contextual behavioral science is in fact trying to answer this question and help humans become more psychologically flexible. What is contextual behavioral science? Well, it's sometimes considered part of the so-called third wave of behavioral therapy. The first wave in the 1950s uh, was basically behaviorism and uh, focusing on conditioning, um, which saw humans basically as equivalent to animals, the kind of behavioral change, uh, change mechanisms that we can observe in animals, we can really just translate to humans. It's the same thing, that was the idea. Then came the second wave, the cognitive behavioral therapy approach, which recognized that humans are not just the same as animals, but humans also have something like language and symbolic behavior, and that greatly influences also our behavior. And so if we want to change behavior, for example, if we want to um, help humans uh, yeah, live more healthy mentally, then we need to focus on controlling and correcting or changing negative and unhelpful thoughts. But it was found that that doesn't always necessarily lead to the uh, expected results. And so in the last decades, the third wave of behavioral therapy emerged. And it started with the premise that actually negative thoughts and feelings are normal. They're part of the normal human condition and everybody, every one of us has to deal with them showing up inside of us um, sooner or later. And so the focus was then more on pre processes like mindfulness practice to be able to watch our thoughts as an observer, to accept them and to diffuse from them, but not necessarily to correct or change them. And it was based also on the recognition that the one thing we really can control is our behavior in the moment and that we can't fully always control our feelings and thoughts, and we also can change the past. And we can also control how we relate to our experiences. And there was also a stronger focus on identifying our values, what's really important to us in life, and to align our behaviors with these values. So it's also a focus stronger on what is really our behaviors for, do they serve our values. And so the aim of contextual behavioral science is to help humans develop so-called psychological flexibility, which we can also a little bit equate with the idea of individual resilience, a concept that we have already talked about previously. And it is the ability to react flexibly to inner and outer experience and act in accordance to one's values, even in the face of challenges such as when uncomfortable thoughts and feelings show up. And contextual behavioral science really builds on an evolutionary understanding of human perception and behavior, including the role of language and symbols. And so the field develops many different frameworks and methods to help humans practice um, this kind of psychological flexibility. Many studies show that when we measure the degree of psychological flexibility of humans, that correlates with measures of mental health, such as the degree of anxiety or depression in people. This is from a study that looked at the effects of COVID-19 lockdown on mental health outcomes.
and it shows that the degree of psychological flexibility correlated with the um, degree of people showing symptoms of anxiety or depression. Psychological flexibility is made up of several processes, and this is um, so six processes uh, are often distinguished, and this is sometimes shown in this kind of diagram called the hexaflex. And so here we find processes such as mindful awareness in the present moment, um, being aware or identifying our values, the idea of accepting our inner and outer experiences in the moment, and also something like diffusion, which we talk about in a moment, or the idea of seeing the self as more like a context or a process. We can also distinguish them into or group them into three types of processes. So on the one hand, the ability of being open in the moment, the idea of being present, and the idea of doing what's really important. And we can also contrast these with processes of psychological inflexibility. So these would be types of behaviors or processes that are characterized by us being kind of more often stuck in the past and the future in our mind, us not really knowing what's important and lacking kind of direction in our life, us being more about a lot of the time avoiding difficult experiences or being fused with our thoughts and also seeing ourselves kind of as a rigid, concrete concept, us telling ourselves this is how we are, rather than seeing ourselves as a continuously changing process in context. There are also then metaphors that are developed for different kinds of people, such as this one for kids and teens especially, but it can also be helpful for adults. It's the so-called DNAV model, so it's kind of the idea to develop certain metaphors that might be helpful for people to create a better relationship with the behaviors of their mind. So in the DNAV model, we distinguish the noticer, that is our ability for mindfulness, the discoverer, that is our ability to change behaviors or to try new behaviors, the advisor, this is our inner voice, our thoughts, memories, and our values. And again, the aim is to um, use these different processes flexibly towards valued living. And there are many different kinds of resources, materials that have been developed by different people. For example, the Connect curriculum is a curriculum for kindergarten to sixth grade in the UK that really covers uh, in depth all of these metaphors and a lot of practices to help children develop these skills for flex psychological flexibility. I want to mention um, one particular aspect that contextual behavioral science brings in, and that is a, an interesting view on the role of language and, and symbols in our psychological flexibility or inflexibility. Here's a quote that really summarizes this notion very well. Although we humans have gained the ability to extract ourselves from the physical jungle through language, which we are now recreating the danger of the jungle in our heads again and again. So think about this for a moment. What does this quote say? It really um, encapsulates this kind of double-edged sword that we have with language. Language is a great a tool. It allows us to do many things with other people also and communicate, but at the same time, um, through language in our heads, we can imagine all sorts of dangerous, challenging things that we recreate in our heads over and over again, even if they might not be there in reality. And this can cause many problems for our well-being. And so diffusion is really about not taking one's thoughts too literal or as the absolute truth and to develop a more flexible observer stance to the content of one's thoughts. For example, if I ask you, what do we see here? Chances are, you might say, I see a fire. This is a fire. But of course, in reality, this is not really a fire. It's just pixels on, on your screen or colors on the wall, depending on where you are watching this video. 
And so the fact that we, without thinking much about it, we automatically say that we are seeing a fire, that gives us a glimpse about how our mind operates on, on language and symbolic thinking. It can be very helpful that we see these color blotches immediately as equivalent to a fire. It helps us really talk with others about a fire, even though there isn't one here, or it makes us aware that maybe if we see the sign of a fire, we should um, maybe run out of the building or something. This can be very helpful. But at the same time, the fact that we really equate a symbol very quickly with the thing that it stands for can sometimes make us forget the difference. So we start to really see words and symbols as the thing that they stand for. And so this can become really problematic that we become fused with the content of our thoughts and really believe them and take them literally. And, and so diffusion is about allowing us to create a little bit more distance and to use symbols more flexibly. And so many different techniques, methods have been developed to practice this kind of diffusion. For example, we can think of our thoughts as a kind of radio that is playing in the background and um, that we can listen to or not. Um, thoughts as leaves on a stream, so different thoughts that just come and go, or thoughts as clouds thoughts as passengers on a bus, or simply noticing that we are having a thought, a thought that says X and Y. Rather than viewing the world through our thoughts, we can observe that we are having a thought. Or more physical things like writing the thoughts on your hand or wearing thoughts on a t-shirt to really literally take them outside our head and be able to literally observe them. These can be techniques that we can practice to to really help us develop this more diffused um, relation to the content of our thoughts. And in the next videos, we will explore some other concepts that make up psychological flexibility, especially mindfulness and values. Mm -hmm.